In this episode, we speak with Albert Nieto Riera, co-founder and co-CEO of SeedTag. SeedTag is a leading contextual advertising company in Europe and Latin America. With AI technology based on machine learning algorithms, the company powers the most relevant and engaging communications in a privacy-first world through contextual advertising. The company has raised over $300 million from leading investors, including Advent International and Oakley Capital. SeedTag was founded in 2014 by two former Googlers with a clear mission, to change how online advertising is done. Today, SeedTag has a large international presence with over 400 employees across offices in Europe, the United States, and Latin America. I'm your host, RJ Lumba. We hope you enjoy the show. RJ Lumba is the managing partner of GrowthCap and the executive chairman of Market Insight Media. He is the host of Growth Investor, a podcast featuring today's best investors, executives, and founders. In the minutes ahead, we'll uncover insights and strategies for accelerating growth and succeeding in business. Albert, great to chat with you. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. So I'm very excited to speak with you saw that you did a big round this past summer, 250 million euro you raised from Advent. That's a significant sum. You were founded in 2014, I believe. And so you're scaling, at least in the recent months and probably years, fairly rapidly. First off, for our audience, tell us about your company and what it does. Yeah, so I'm the co-founder of CTAC. CTAC is the leading contextual advertising company in Europe and Latin America. We're in the ad tech space. Contextual advertising, for those who doesn't know it, is all these advertising solutions and products that are targeted based on anything that is not related with who is behind the screen. Okay, so we are very used to cookie-based targeting and audience targeting. So the ads that you are seeing is based on a profiling that exists about your person based on the navigation that you had in the web. What we do is completely the opposite. So we fully respect your privacy and we understand thanks to artificial intelligence and machine learning models, the content that you are reading through natural language processing, through computer vision, etc. We classify that content and we deliver ads based on all these signals. So it doesn't matter who is behind the screen. What it matters is what is reading in real time, what he's showing interest in real time. Excellent. Ad tech and that whole segment it's ebbed and flowed in terms of the interest of technologists, the interests of investors, but you're obviously coming up with something new. What I was interested in is your background leading up to the founding of the company. Could you share with us a little bit about what led you to this idea? Yeah, in terms of the early days, I was working at Google. I was a data analyst in the Madrid office, and my co-founder, Jorge, was doing exactly the same job. I mean, Google is a great brand. Uh, When you receive an offer from them, you automatically believe that you are very smart. What they achieved in terms of positioning their company in that space is amazing. But I was 28 years old. He was 30 years old when we founded SeedTech. What we felt is that it was not the company for us to really develop and challenge ourselves in our 30s. So we started to discuss some business ideas together. Jorge, who is the classical product founder, I'm much more business oriented and people oriented. He is the creative guy. He came up with this idea of transforming editorial images into shoppable images, very similar to the product that Instagram released one or two years ago that you can really buy any stuff that you can see in the images in Instagram. We created the same product for the open web for all the publishers to really sign up. That was the origin of SeedTech. The problem with that, which I think is a shared story with all the startups that you talk to, is that the original idea didn't work very well, but we were able to pivot and transform our original idea into a very profitable business, discovering first what we called in-image advertising, that even if images were not good to deliver actual sales on products that was not performing. Images were great to do brand advertising. It was a great asset that it was not used in the web. So we exploit that opportunity. And later on, with all the privacy movement and the third-party cookie deprecation that appeared in the web, we realized that the technology that we developed to do in image advertising, it was actually a contextual technology that it could be applied to any placement of the web. 
And that brought us a lot of scale and a lot of new opportunities. And that's what made Seed Tech really big and what it is today. Google is well known for being very difficult to get into. And we do see actually a lot of entrepreneurs that have come out of Google to start their own businesses. But I bet it's still a small percentage, like the number of people who actually go off and do something on their own and succeed to the extent you have so far is probably still limited. What do you think it is that has enabled you and your co-founder to get to this point in the company lifecycle? We are first-time entrepreneurs. Everybody asks, what's the formula? I don't believe that there is an actual formula. First of all, you have to try. If you, if you don't try, you will never know if you are able to achieve that or not. And then I think building a company and the journey of a company is a set of a lot of small decisions that either take you to success and to the next round or they lead you to failure. So I think we were good at executing our business model. We were good at taking the right bets in terms of investing capital in the areas that led us to the next stage. And we always said that we had like a framework to manage our business, which was, okay, there are different stages. The first stage is from zero to 5 million, which everything is about product market fit. So you have to focus on having clients that they buy your product and they are happy customers and they repeat. Every effort that you dedicate outside finding product market fit is a wasted effort. The next stage was from 5 to 50 million, which was about proving that the product market fit that you found, that we found in Spain, was replicable in other markets. And the stage that we are at the moment is from 50 to 500 million is to becoming a category leader in your space. Okay. One of the things that is very exciting about us is that we are competing in a space, which is contextual advertising, that is big, that is growing, and that it doesn't have a clear leader. Because if, if I would be working on search, you would say, okay, there is a company called Google that is doing a pretty decent job. Uh, you're going to have a tough time, but probably you cannot name me who is the contextual advertising leader worldwide. And the reason is because it's not clear. And I think we have this shot of building in the open web, global player with global presence that leads contextual advertising, which is going to be really big in the near future. And I, I guess that's what Advan International saw. And that's why they invested a very significant amount on us. And yeah, that's what we are trying to do here in the US. It's often debated how effective the original founder can be as the leader and CEO of a company that's grown dramatically and is now entering you know, a whole new level scale-wise. How have you managed that? Obviously, you have to be a different leader and focus on different things at each stage, as you had mentioned. What have you had to change? I mean, are there things about mindset? Are there things about how you operate and, and what you tactically focus on and spend your time on? For me, the, the first thing is accepting that what you just said is a reality. So I'm the founder of the company, but I don't necessarily need to be the CEO of the company. So I was effective to take the company to where it is today. It's a question mark if I'm going to be effective to take the company to this 500 million and then from 500 to 5,000, okay? because the skill set is completely different. The amount of risk that your board might be willing to take on keeping or removing the original founder is different at every stage. So the first thing is acknowledging that you might not be the best CEO. In terms of what I've done to really scale with the company, I'm a big believer of this been there, done that approach. And as a first time founder, I've never done it. So what I've done is try to talk to a lot of CEOs in my industry in particular, but in other industries as well that have faced similar challenges and be very open on sharing, okay, I, I have a pain point on hiring developers to scale my tech. Okay. I have a pain point on opening outside Europe because what works in Europe doesn't work in Latin America or doesn't work in the US. What have you done? And it's very impressive the amount of information that you can get from others that faced exactly the same problems that you are facing at the moment. And they are, in general, very open to, to share their experiences and their advice. And then you, you take a little bit from all of them and you try not to repeat those mistakes. You, you will do for, for sure others, but at least you have a, you're better equipped to do this job. 
I've heard two different sides to this about when you're interacting with others in the industry and tech and how you seek advice and how much you can disclose about what you're doing, your technology. How are you able to have like open conversations about what you're doing, giving it enough context so that someone could give you good advice back? In general, we are very open and very transparent. And that is probably not true at the very edge of the technology and the research that probably the confidentiality of what you are working on should be really critical. For 99% of the companies, I think that's not the case. I think you will win much more by being open about what you are working on, uh, which are the key areas of priority that your company is focusing at the moment, what's working and what's not. And the majority of conversations that I'm having, they are not related to what we should do what we should develop for our clients. That's typically not the problem. For instance, what you were mentioning before, okay? So how do I expand to the US? Should I invest in New York, in Chicago, in LA, or can I just put a small team in New York and it's going to work out? What's your experience? So these kind of decisions about how to properly scale a business, decisions about how to incentivize a sales team in a different region, Decisions about how to scale a tech team to really develop multi-products because before your company had only one product and it was very easy, but now you have four business lines because the company grow that way and it has a profound impact on the organization of the tech team. So all these things is the things that if you discuss with people that faced similar situations, I think you get a lot of intel and people is quite open to discuss about. One thing we always talk about on this podcast is your experience with investors and how they've been able to add value to you and your company beyond simply the financial capital. Can you give us a little bit of insight on how you interact with your investors and what they've been able to help you on? It's a very good question because if you have a good business, and maybe it sounds a little bit hard, but money is a commodity. You can get term sheets from multiple businesses. The difficult part is having a good, scalable business. But if you do have that, then you will have a lot of VCs and PEs and investors in general willing to deploy capital because they are all day long looking for this kind of growing businesses. In our case, we don't believe a lot in this smart capital concept, but investors helped us in some critical moments along the journey. A specific example of that is... We were three co-founders at the beginning. We had a conflict with one of the co-founders. For us, it was like the end of the world. We didn't know how to manage it. We went to one of them and said, okay, that's a classical thing. And I'm going to tell you how we're going to solve that. It will happen this, this, and this. You won't be very happy here, but then you will be more happy. And this clarity of how to solve a problem like that, it was very good. Another example, I remember when we were hitting $8 million in revenue. I was still doing the CFO part, you know, all the administrative part. And the VC said, it's time for you to hire a CFO. I said, no, no, but I can keep doing, no, no, no. You have to focus 100% on business development. You cannot do the CFO role in the weekends in your free time. Just focus on that. It's the good for the company. And now it's super obvious for me. It's like, how could you even challenge that suggestion? But at that time, it was not that obvious. In terms of corporate governance and this kind of advice, and also for M&A, for example, we acquired three companies in our journey. They've done it multiple times, so they know how to structure an effective earnout, which are going to be the classical issues integrating a company. So all that is useful, but I think it's fundamental with an investor to draw a very clear line of what is management and what is a board decision. This is our very hands-off. Okay, So they bet on the entrepreneur, they bet on the vision, and they hope for the best, uh, basically. <laughs> this is a very different game. We are starting also to experience that with Advan. It's a, it's a new chapter, but they are much closer to being operators of the business than to being investors in the business. So that's something new for us, but I'm sure it's going to be for the best of the, the company. And is that why you chose Advan? Because you saw that they have some of this operational strength? Not really. We chose Advan because, well, first of all, it's a world-class PE. They had a, a, an excellent reputation. So we were not raising capital, actually. Uh, so a lot of PEs reached out, but the private equity that we saw that they were 
really believing the most in what we were trying to build and they were very determined to to make it happen and not to bother us too much in our operation even if due diligence is always a pain but they were very respectful with that that was what convinced us that they were the right partner and in the decision of should we raise that capital yes or no for us the key reason to go with them was that now we have another tool to execute on our vision, which is inorganic growth. So before we always said, okay, we would like to do that. That makes industrial sense, but we don't have the financial power to execute it. So we don't even analyze it. Now the framework is anything that makes industrial sense and that helps you accelerate and execute on your vision, let's analyze it because we can certainly analyze acquiring public companies that before it was completely out of scope for us. So it changed the amount of ambition and the tools that we have to execute in our vision. And that's a new chapter and it's very exciting for us. I'd like to end with a couple of questions here that I ask almost every guest. One is, can you tell us about a book that you've read that has had a profound impact on you or you can simply provide a book recommendation? On the business side, the book that I like the most, I read some of them, but the book I like the most was the hard things about hard things about Anderson Horowitz. And I liked it because it's a very practical book. It, it tackles issues of the day to day, you know, so how to fire, do you have to celebrate success or focus on the next big thing? The trade off between perfection in decision making versus speed in decision making. So all these kind of things that are very practical that you are suffering in your self on a daily basis. It's a really good book with a lot of advice. So I really recommend it, especially to early stage entrepreneurs. Can you tell us about a CEO or leader that you particularly admire? In terms of leader or thinker, I really like Naval, Naval Rabican. I think he was the founder of AngelList and he's been an investor and participated in a lot of very popular podcasts. Everything he says, it resonates a lot to me. And for me, is the clarity of the thinking and, and the ideas. I think exactly the same thing, but I couldn't have explained it in such plain words. It's this feeling of you are listening to him and you are consolidating wisdom that it was in you, but now it's more clear. That's fantastic. I think it's an amazing talent. And I really like that from him. And in terms of CEO, that's maybe a, a little bit of a contrarian thought uh, today, but still what Elon Musk has done and is doing, working like crazy on trying to solve some of the biggest problems of humanity. I think it's really impressive. And now it's kind of funny that with the acquisition of Twitter, he kind of works in my space. So I'm very curious to see what he's able to do at Twitter. And I'm more optimistic than others in terms of what he can achieve in the midterm. So let's see. Excellent. Well, Albert, I want to thank you again for taking the time. It's been a, a wonderful conversation. Thank oh, you. Oh, yeah. Thanks for inviting me.